going live on YouTube. Awesome. Okay, we're good. Okay, all right. Well, welcome. Uh, we are here on, at our one of our last programs for the month. Uh, welcome everyone here at Valentine Central College Student Life and Development Program. My name is Maya Cardenas. Um, I am our Associate Dean of Student Services. Um, overseeing our student life programs, uh, along with my colleagues here, Susanna Ortega uh, and Deja Pruitt, and I think Maricela Magana somewhere there in the YouTube hemisphere. Uh, we have, we're excited, y'all. We have a wonderful uh, lecture um, uh, lined up for y'all today. This took some doing, uh, but we are so, so grateful to have a wonderful uh, professor here um, to give us some great knowledge with regard to how we can protect ourselves and our families um, against COVID-19 and other respiratory viruses. Um, so I'm going to get right into the program. Um, before I do the introduction of um, one of our local professors here, a wonderful uh, supportive uh, faculty member, I do wanna go over some logistics really quickly. Uh, so we are gonna be live streaming this simultaneously um, uh, in the webinar itself. Um, you will be able to ask questions through our little Q&A functionality here. If you're familiar with the uh, Zoom webinar function, you can ask your questions here in the Q&A. And then we also are open, uh, the chat is open at the YouTube um, channel. So please feel free to also, if you're a member of the community, to ask your questions there as well. And we will make sure to get those um, in the lineup uh, to have that an th those answered. Uh, the format for today is uh, gonna start off with a lecture with Dr. Jimenez, um, our guest, uh, and then at about the 45 minute mark, depending on how uh, much info we can cram in, uh, we will open it up to the Q&A and then finish our program uh, with the Q&A. So, uh, I'm excited. I know for those of you that are uh, huge uh, uh, science uh, folks and interested in how we can protect ourselves, this is an exciting program for you. Uh, Dr. Jimenez has a great following on Twitter, so please find him on Twitter as well. And without further ado, uh, let me introduce our uh, local supporter here. I cannot thank him enough for offering um, his guidance and uh, support of this burgeoning idea to just make folks more aware and, and give them great options. Um, so our department chair here of our biology sciences um, department. So technically this event is an MSJC Biology Presents event. Uh, Professor Michael Plotkin, uh, if you'd like to jump in now and uh, open a program. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, welcome and we're really excited to host Dr. Jimenez today. So MSJC, like many other educational institutions, has returned to in-person teaching Yet the COVID-19 pandemic remains against appearances very much with us. In the United States on average, 56 people have died every hour during the last month. And we're now approaching 1 million dead. Globally, the toll stands at over 292 people dead per hour with 6.1 million total deaths, undoubtedly a gross undercount. Tallying mortality downplays the personal health and financial costs to those who survived the infection, a focus on mortality alone ignores the strain morbidity puts on families, communities, our healthcare system, and our economy. Thankfully, trends are now going in the right direction. And as we begin to assess the impact of this pandemic, I would like to note two unanticipated signal benefits it has given us. One is that we are now all very familiar, perhaps too much familiar with the capabilities of video conferencing, a technology without which we could not have brought our outstanding speaker to MSJC today. The other is the great stride science, physical, biological, and social has made in the course of addressing every aspect of this crisis. We have seen the rapid advent, not only of new vaccines, but new vaccine technologies, new surveillance mechanisms, medical treatments, innovative social and economic analyses, and most significantly, an improved understanding of epidemiology, virology, transmissibility, and pathophysiology, much of it generalizable beyond this pandemic. It is in this last regard that our presenter today marvelous, marvelously represents the great hope science promises to humanity under the shadow of natural disaster. So Jose Luis Jimenez is a distinguished professor of chemistry at University of Colorado Boulder and a fellow of the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences. Um, he completed his PhD at MIT after earning a master's from the University of Zaragoza in Spain and the University of Compiègne in France. His research primarily involves aerosols, which you'll find out a lot about today, aerosol measurement and computer modeling. 
He is a highly cited researcher publishing in such apex journals as The Lancet and Science. He is a fellow of the American Association of Aerosol Research and the American Geophysical Union. His work has addressed a number of critical issues, including global warming and recently airborne transmission of infectious diseases. He'll present today on the modes of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory viruses, what we now know and how to protect ourselves. Um, as Maya mentioned, following his presentation, there will be ample time for questions and discussion. So please welcome him, um, Jose Luis Jimenez. Um, thank you, Professor Plotkin and, and Maya for that uh, kind introduction. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Looks good. And if so, without further ado, um, I'll start, start with it. Okay. So um, I think, uh, yeah, the topic doesn't need a lot of introduction. We, we probably all know too much and are too tired of, of this pandemic and this virus, but, but there are things that are still not clear and what we can do better and in ways that are not very difficult, especially we understand it. So that's kind of um, what, I'm, what I'm going to be aiming at. You know, we can protect ourselves and protect our families and our friends and our colleagues from transmission better than we have been doing. Okay. Um, I'll put these links in the chat, but basically I also put them in, in Twitter. You have copies of all my slides there and with all the links to the papers and everything. So if you want more information that you can definitely find it that way. Mm -hmm. This is the outline that I'm going to follow. So I will talk about two things. One is kind of the science and the history is like, okay, how does transmission work? How do we know it works that way? And why has there been, why has this topic been so controversial and, and organizations like the CDC being so slow in, in understanding what was going on? And the second one is like, okay, now we have, that we understand how it works, what can we do to protect ourselves? Okay. And there is this progress bar at the bottom where you can also see um, kind of where, where we are along the, the topics. So we'll start with, with the modes of transmission, some introduction. Okay, so, so we have, let me see, I put the pointer as a pen. Normally people can see it better. So <clears throat> the key here is that we have a person that's infected. So this is the infected person and they have the virus is present in their saliva and the respiratory fluid, which is the liquid that basically wets the inside of their, their nose, their trachea, their um, lungs. And the virus and some of these fluids have to go out through the physical world in some way to encounter the other person, you know, the person on the right who's susceptible um, of infection, right? Now, um, this can happen through surfaces, you know, if, if the infected person has touched, uh, you know, their nose or something like that, and then they, they touch some object or, or they touch each other's hands, the virus in principle can go that way. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought this was very important and we all disinfected the groceries and disinfected the tables and whatever. whatever. As of today, there are zero demonstrated cases of surface transmission. It's unclear whether it happens at all, but we know for sure is not important. It's not why we are in a pandemic, right? So I won't say any more about surfaces. We should stop disinfecting and just wash our hands is a good idea for, for other reasons, mostly for other diseases but I won't say more about that. So then how does the virus, if it's not through the surfaces, how is it getting from one person to another? So basically through the air in one of two ways, basically through little balls of saliva or respiratory fluid that leave one person and reach the other. And they are divided in two sizes, the big and the small, right? And then the big ones in this field, they tend to call drops or droplets, the small ones we tend to call them aerosols. Okay? So here, as you see, we have this, um, let me see my, my pointer, my pointer where it is. We have this blue one that is basically a projectile, follows a ballistic trajectory, leaves one person, like if I'm talking excitedly or if I cough, <clears throat> then these uh, droplets that are visible, they're large enough to be seen, fly through the air, and then they can hit the other person. And if they hit you inside the eye, inside this very small exposed part of the nostrils or inside the mouth, they can lead to infection. If they hit you here, or if they hit you there, or then nothing happens. And if they don't hit anyone, they fall to the ground, right? At the beginning of the pandemic, we were told this is how we are getting infected. But every time one of these drops that are visible come out, a thousand smaller ones come out as well, these aerosols. And those now, because they're much smaller, they float like smoke. Smoke is another aerosol, right? 
you see the smoke and these are balls of, in that case, uh, stuff from the, from the cigarette or whatever, but they, they don't fall to the ground very quickly. It floats, it follows, follows air currents. And then the aerosols don't infect because they hit you inside the eye or something like that, but because you breathe them in by inhalation. Okay, so that's why we divide them into big and small because the big ones, they are projectiles and they infect by impact. The small ones, the aerosols, um, they basically, they float in the air and they infect by breathing them in. Okay. That's what I just said. So as I said at the beginning of the pandemic, we were told, for example, this is a video from WHO that you can still see on their Twitter feed. And this person, you know, was infected and um, his nieces, I think, and then the projectiles fly through the air and they hit this person and then she can be infected that way, right? So these droplet projectiles. Now they told us, keep your distance. If you keep your distance, then these droplets are gonna follow a parabolic trajectory like you learn in physics class, and then they're gonna fall and then um, the person that was far enough is safe, okay? So this is reasonable. If, if this is really how we're getting infected, distance will help, right? The problem is that the fact that there was less infection as we got more distant was taken as proof of droplets when it's really just a hypothesis. There are other ways this can happen, right? And even to this day, many public health authorities say, well, whenever the infection happens when two people are close, is these big droplets, like in this case here, if this person gets infected or then it's because this person spit, basically micro spit some droplets into their face is not due to aerosols, right? But we know at the same time that there is many cases of super spreading events and infection at a distance, which somehow are these aerosols that are floating in and then this person is breathing them in. But how are the aerosols coming here? If, if here we only have droplets, right? That doesn't make sense. Really what, what's going on is better represented in this picture to be more diluted here, but still be able to, to lead to infection by this person breathing them, they need to be much more concentrated um, when they leave the, the infected person, okay? So when you get infected, when you're close and when you are more distant, you get less infection, less transmission. That can be because you're breathing in less aerosol. Like if someone, you're talking to someone who has eaten garlic and then they are keeping more and more distance and it smells of garlic less and less. That's because you're breathing in less of the air that they just exhaled, right? Um, and it's, it's not a proof of droplets. It may, it may well be all aerosols. Yeah. So this is kind of some, of some of the definitions. Now, what are these aerosols? If we put the microscope to them, um, what are they? And this is not what they are. You know, the, the virus is about um, 0.1 microns. So uh, um, how much is that? 0.1 millionths of a meter, right? So it's very small. and. Uh, this is a picture actually from the Journal of the American Medical Society. You know, a couple of years ago, they published this picture and it looks like the virus is basically in a droplet of water, which may be 0.2 microns and, and is floating in the air in these very, very small droplets. That's not what we think happens. You know, I think we think a more realistic uh, version is this. We have a droplet of saliva or respiratory fluid, which is mostly something else than the virus. It's water and mucin and sodium chloride and other things. And then there are a few viruses sprinkled in there, but the viruses are a very small fraction of the droplet. This is important when you think, for example, about masks or things like that, because you are really trying to remove from the air a much bigger clump. It's still light enough that it floats, but it's a much bigger clump than the virus itself. Okay, okay so I'm telling you that the, the virus were breathing it in. Um, how do we know this? Okay, so I'll try, I could, I could spend hours talking about this. I'll try to give you the very brief version. This is a paper that we published about a year ago in The Lancet, where we summarized 10 different reasons, 10 different lines of evidence why we thought airborne transmission was, was dominant. And, and this paper is one of the most, um, the most impactful in The Lancet ever. And what we concluded there is that although other routes can contribute, we believe that airborne transmission is dominant, okay? is likely to be dominant. Why did we say that? Why were we using such a strong language? for a number of reasons. Um, the easiest to understand is long distance transmission. Okay? So if someone gets infected very far, which is out of the reach of projectiles and, and they don't touch any surface, the only way they could have been infected is through the air, right? Historically, this has seen for a number of diseases and there are many cases now documented and published for COVID. And in, in, this is one case, one diagram from 
from a publication in New Zealand. So these people came and uh, one person came and, and went into this room, room 277. And then, you know, they were there and, and they had the door closed. And then a family came uh, a couple of days later and they were in the room across the hall from it, right? And these people never were in the same room. There were cameras, you know, they, they know exactly what they did. They were never talking to each other. They were never in a situation where the droplets could go from one to the other. But what we think happened is that this person on the left may have had a, the window open and then the pressure of the wind probably pushed, pushed the air and then the air went under the door and infected three people over here. Okay. And they know because they did the genomics of the virus is the exact same virus that the person in the other room had. So they know these people got the virus from the person in the other room and they know the only place that was possible was from the air. And it's, this is what we call long distance transmission. It's, it's not, they were not in the same room at the same time. This, and, and this is, there's no other way to explain it than, than transmission through the air. Um, now, something else that, that has been clear since early in the pandemic is that we have much more transmission outdoors than indoors. And I'll show some data from Japan. They followed people who had COVID early in the pandemic, but by then they had already met with other people. You know, so for example, they had 22 people who had met uh, with people indoors and 88 who had met with people outdoors. The people who met indoors, six of them didn't infect anyone, but 16 did, you know, so it was pretty easy to infect others indoors. And, and we see three, four, nine, 12, three, three. So they, they start to be super spreading. Indoors, we're, we're able, or these people are able to infect a lot of people. On the other hand, outdoors is totally reversed. Out of 88, 77 didn't infect anybody and 11 infected someone, but it was almost always one, right? And always the person they were talking to. Okay? So there is a, an enormous discrepancy. It's much easier to get infected um, indoors. Okay? And we know actually there are studies that we actually get closer to other people outdoors because the lack of the ceiling makes us feel more comfortable. This is something psychologists study. So it's not that the droplets are doing anything different. They, they should behave the same way. If this was this droplets that WHO says, it should, it should be the same in and outdoors, but it's 20 times less. This tells us it has to be basically 95% just these aerosols that float in the air and that outdoors are dispersed fa much faster because of the wind and there is no ceiling to trap them. Um, something else is like, we have seen all these super spreading events, you know, the famous choir and the restaurant and the buses. And I'm sure you've seen this in the press multiple times. These super spreading events only happen in places that have low ventilation, right? Um, and they are important. This is, this is contact tracing they did in Hong Kong. So they saw, for example, there was this, uh, this super spreading event where uh, many cases were traced to some bars and you see all the yellow ones were basically infected there. Then some people went on to infect other people. And then there were these other clusters, like for example, this another cluster. And then there were also cases in which one person infected another, you know, and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, so there is cases in which probably there are people talking close to each other, but there were also cases in which one person infected many, right? And this is half the cases. The other half of the cases they tried, but they couldn't tell where they were infected, which again, suggest this was through through the air, but at more distance. So it wasn't obvious that it was someone they had met with, but maybe someone else that was there in the coffee shop or whatever that had infected them. Uh, we investigated the Skagit Choir case in, in Washington. This was published in the LA Times and I called the choir and immediately after talking to them, I was like, there's no way to explain this other than airborne transmission. And we published a paper that has a lot of details um, uh, a year and a half ago. I, I won't go through the details, but basically there is no other way to explain it other. And, and there are many of these super spreading events in which basically one person infects many, right? And, and every time one of them is examined, is like, okay, it was through the air or it was most likely through the air. As far as I know, there is zero cases of super spreading that people have been able to say, oh, it was this other mechanism. Okay. Now we have a, a paper and this, this, is, this is a graph. I don't think I have any equations, but, but I have a graph. Uh, so, you know, so if you are not in, in the sciences, bear with me. Basically we are showing the relationship between the, the attack rate, which is the vertical axis. So this means, you know, how many people get infected. Sorry, I'm a little clumsy with this, with this pen. So here 100% of the people who were present get infected. 
you know, below here, uh, so here be 40%, here is 0%, right? And this is plotted versus what we call a risk parameter. What's a risk parameter? Well, it's something that if there is more risk of airborne transmission of breathing the air exhaled by the infected, that will increase. So you have less ventilation, more people, more time, less masks, then the risk parameter increases. If, we, if you're in a place that you're outdoors or is well ventilated or you have masks or you spend very little time, then we move to the left, okay? And these are all the cases, all the famous cases from the literature. Our, our choir is one of these ones over here. So now um, what we see is that they all kind of seem to line up. And then this line is, is not a fit to data. This is a model, a mathematical model of airborne transmission, right? So if these were explained by airborne transmission, they would line up with the line, which they do to a good approximation. And, and remember, these are cases one investigated in Hong Kong by one team, another in Washington by another team, another in, in Europe by another team. So to me, it's pretty amazing that they that they work this well. And here, you know, so again, the choirs, the airplane, the meatpacking in Germany, the buses in um, in China, the school in Israel, the call center in Korea. You know, the, all the all the ones you've heard about. There are a lot of those are here. Okay. Um, now, so after we published that, we, we looked back at the scientific li literature and said, well, you know, what about the flu? What about colds? What about the first SARS or MERS? And, and once you look at the publications who have actually reported the data, you see that those are also all airborne. But if you go to the CDC webpage or the WHO webpage, there is no mention of it whatsoever. They only talk about these large droplets that fall to the ground and the surfaces, even though they also don't really have evidence. Okay? So, I mean, so what we publish is really all the respiratory viruses we think are, are also airborne. Okay. Now, so I told you, okay, there is a lot of evidence this, this virus, we're breathing it in. Why do I have to come to tell you this? Why is, why is CDC not saying this clearly? Why, did, why, why have they resisted so much? Okay. And um, how much they have resisted? A lot. This is uh, so in four days, it'll be two years of, of this tweet and this message from WHO saying that it was a fact that this was not airborne. It was this, these droplets that, that fall to the ground that are too heavy to hang in the air. And also you can have these surfaces. And that saying that it was going through the air was misinformation. So think for a moment, WHO told us two years ago that the main way the virus actually spreads was misinformation. This is a huge error. This is one of the biggest errors in the history of public health, in my opinion. And, and created, I mean, helped the pandemic expand greatly because, you know, it was coming country after country. We were washing our hands, but we were still in the same room without a mask. You know, so the virus got everywhere, you know, and it started creating variants and all these things. And also that period when we were all paying attention, you know, they told us disinfect the, the groceries. Okay, we disinfect the groceries and we did weird stuff like that. You know, had they told us, had they explained correctly how it was transmitted, we would have done what was needed. Well, later, you know, we're all tired, there is more resistance, there's more confusion. So anyway, I mean, so part of my last two years have been like, like this, this is, you know, this is WHO here represented at the ship. And then there's a few of us trying to get them unstuck and really feeling, I saw this movie of Don't Look Up about, uh, which is it's more about uh, um, a metaphor of climate change, but it's very much similar to, to the way we were treated. In fact, I think we were treated worse than, uh, than those scientists in the movie. Now, that was in March of 2020. So in November of 2020, so this is many months later, WHO suddenly started saying ventilation is important. Now, for someone like me, you know, ventilation is not, you know, something on a surface or a projectile that flies between, doesn't care about ventilation, right? If ventilation is important, it's airborne. However, they didn't say why. They only said that ventilation was important. And we asked them, they wouldn't say. Now, in May of 2021, they said, oh, we're saying it's important because it's airborne, but we don't want to say it. We don't want to say it's airborne. And this has created just a, a huge amount of, of confusion, unfortunately. And um, in December of 2021, so three months ago, really, uh, finally WHO said it more clearly on this webpage. So if you go to the frequently asked questions, it does say, okay, yeah, this virus is airborne. And what I told you, you can breathe it in in close proximity or you can breathe it, breathe it in when you share a room. 
Now, this is only this web page that you have to know is there. You know, someone has to tell you. They don't talk about this in their press conferences or the Twitter feed or whatever. The word airborne doesn't appear. But anyway, uh, at least it's there because it was just too scientifically embarrassing to continue to deny it. And actually just yesterday, I mean, the CDC is actually behind the WHO in, in, that, in that area. But the White House yesterday, we've been working actually with the White House. They ask um, uh, many scientists, including myself, uh, to help them with, with this new plan. And, and they announced it and, and they said, yeah, they, this, is, this virus is airborne. It's basically, they are saying here in, in this document exactly what I told you, is tiny airborne particles of the virus that are hanging in the air and we breathe them in and you know, we want to avoid breathing the air. You know. Now, I hope they tell the CDC, but, but anyway, this is, uh, this is where we are right now. It's, I mean, it's, it's been moving in this direction because the evidence is overwhelming. It's taken a, a desperately long amount of time. So why has it taken two years you know, to get here when the evidence is so clear? You know? um, the history is very important, I think, is the politics are too, but, but history is very important. And um, so let me give you the, the three minute version of the history. Okay? So during the history of humanity, since Hippocrates in ancient Greece, so he said that, well, it was the, his disciples probably they wrote that you know when a lot of people get infected at the same time it must be that they are infected through the air because it's the thing that we share the most and that became basically the, in the west the dominant paradigm you know we believe that most diseases were transmitted through the air that was my asthma theory right and really continues i mean there's there's a lot of history and details and theories but basically it's the dominant theory until about the 1850s 1860s and then, you know, John Snow discovers that cholera goes through the water. Nobody believes him, but 10 years later, it is accepted. Then Ignaz Semmelweis discovers that puerperal fever and other disease goes through the hands. Nobody believes him and he dies before he's accepted, but eventually it's accepted, you know. And in the 1890s, someone proposes that malaria, which malaria, malaria means bad air in Italian, you know. However, the, it is uh, shown to be transmitted by mosquitoes. So, so suddenly, and that's at the, the time that Pasteur and Koch, they discovered germ theory. So we're starting to understand how diseases are transmitted. And these diseases are, are easier, you know, water or hands or whatever are easier to study, right? So we have believed, you know, for millennia that everything went through the air, but suddenly this is going down, you know. And, uh, you know, so then there is the hypothesis, there is the debate. Maybe, maybe the air was a superstition and nothing goes through the air, right? And there is a debate. And then there is this fellow, Charles Chaping, a very prominent American epidemiologist, and he lives in 1910, and he writes a book where he summarizes all the investigations of how diseases uh, transmit, and he has a pet theory, which is contact infection. Okay. So we, is when, when we touch someone or when we are very close to someone, and, and he's the one who says, is this a spray of droplets? That's how we're getting infected uh, in close proximity. And, and he says, you know, I'm trying to convince people, you know, to wash their hands to protect from, uh, from contact infection, but they, they don't pay attention to me because, you know, if, if they're going to get infected through the air, what is the point of washing your hands? So people still believe that, right? It's impossible to teach people to avoid this. So then he says, we don't really know if anything goes through the air. There's not a lot of evidence, but we're going to just say that it doesn't. So he says, we're going to, so he, he takes, absence of evidence and turns into evidence of absence, basically, and, and says, we're going to discard infection through the air, and then we are all freed from the specter of infected air, whatever. So he says, you know, infection through the air doesn't happen, you know, takes that to the extreme. Now, um, he's too successful, unfortunately, and, and for a number of reasons, including political reasons. But basically now, so we go, you know, from the 1890s, whatever, to you know, 1920s or something like that. And basically uh, people believe that there is nothing that goes through the air, nothing, not important disease goes through the air, right? And um, it's really only uh, in the 1960s, this is William Wells in the picture, a professor at Harvard, um, and they experience a lot of resistance. People say, oh, you are trying to bring back the miasma. This is a retrograde science and whatever, but, but they, they managed to show that tuberculosis is transmitted through the air. So they take, the air from a tuberculosis from tuberculosis patients and the air is piped. And then they had all these guinea pigs here. And for two years they have, I think it's 300 guinea pigs 
exposed to the air from the tuberculosis humans. And I think it's every, every month, three guinea pigs get infected. And then they have another set of guinea pigs that the air is disinfected by ultraviolet light and those don't get infected. You know? And then it can no longer be denied that this has to go through the air, there is no other option, right? And that's uh, Edward Riley, Richard Riley. So anyway, so then since the 1960s, we've been in a slow, you know, the measles and chicken pox were accepted, but there was a lot of resistance. You know, there was, there was a lot of resistance to accept that any disease was airborne. And then it's really been COVID-19 when, when uh, the pandemic has focused enough attention to overcome that resistance to some degree, as, as, as I was telling you earlier. Okay. So the history is, is very important, but also the history created an asymmetry of power. WHO created a committee to see how this disease was transmitted and invited six experts on hand washing and zero experts on transmission through the air because that was so unlikely. You know, and then there was also, you know, there were not enough N95s at the beginning, and there is this fear of panic through the air. I think at the end, what causes panic is a virus you can control. Um, then also people who, who screwed up, you know, who made this huge error don't want to admit it too clearly that that is a problem right now. Um, some other things, but but I think there is also a political problem that you actually see throughout history that it is convenient for governments and organizations. And it's also certain political leanings that is personal responsibility. You know, if uh, if you are getting infected through through the droplets or the hands, you know, you get infected. Ah, oh, you didn't wash your hands. You didn't. It's your fault. You know. However, if you got infected because you breathe infected air in your school, in your office, in in the mall, you know, you didn't have the power to remove the virus from there. That's the responsibility of the school, of the government, of the company. And that's something that they, they want to avoid. It's, it's similar to what we see with climate change, you know, uh, worry about your carbon footprint, but don't do anything for uh, kind of the companies that supply the fossil fuels and stuff like that. Um, anyway, and uh, I'm, I'm short of time, but basically this, we think this is a major paradigm shift, like, like others in science, you know, like uh, suddenly we, we, science believe things went one way that they, the sun went around the earth and now we realize it's the other way around and a lot of things have to change as a consequence. Okay. Um, and now let's keep those details used in the interest of time. So I have a little time to talk about, okay, uh, now that we know how, how to protect, how the transmission happens, how do we protect ourselves? Okay. So I'll, I'll give some ideas um, in the remaining of the time. I think about the most important has been done poorly is communication, okay? It's not so hard to understand if you tell people it's like, this is like a smoke and, and you think about smoke from a cigarette or from vaping and how it behaves in a room, right? You, you tend to see more around the person who's smoking that's exhaling it, but you know, with time it can, it can fill the room. It's trapped by the, uh, by the walls and the ceiling, which is, basic, which is basically a box, right? Now, if we exhale more air, we inhale more air, it's more dangerous and, and with time, you know, it's gonna fill the room, right? And uh, and it's not it's not that hard to understand. Now, once you understand this, is also, for example, many times you're gonna enter a taxi or an office or something like that, and there's someone there and they are not wearing their mask. And then, oh, you're gonna come in, I'm gonna put my mask. But that's that's not the way we should be doing it. If someone is gonna come in into your taxi or into your office, whatever, you should always be wearing a mask because otherwise if you're infected, you may be filling the air with the virus. Okay. So and the best analogy that we have found is cigarette smoke or vaping smoke. It's not perfect, it's not a perfect analogy, but, but it communicates clearly what the virus does in the air. You know? So there is a lot near the, the infected person like the smoker, but you know, with distance it's gonna, it's gonna get diluted and exactly what the smoke is gonna do depends on the room and how the air is going and if you're outdoors, the wind may carry it away. And, in a, in a room where you where you share the earth with others, you know, you know here, I think this is the person who's smoking and maybe this one and, and this person is distant, but they can also get infected because the smoke is gonna fill the room with time, right? Um, so now that we understand this, uh, I'm gonna say a few things about things that we shouldn't do, right? Because because a waste of time or they're actually making things more dangerous. So we have all these plexiglass barriers that, that have been installed and billions and billions of dollars have been spent on plexiglass barriers. Um, they are useful in one situation, right? So the air that leaves this person, you know, it, it may rise, other times it, it goes more straight. But in this situation, if you put a barrier, then that's going to 
impede this direct flow of air with little dilution, right? So this is what you see here. I hope you can see the smoke. And then it hits this barrier and goes up and down. I mean, like if this person is, is, is smoking, you know, eventually the smoke is gonna make it to this person, but it may take a while, okay? So, so in, in this frontal situation, like in a cashier, a teller situation, that, that's a good thing. But now the lateral barriers, when you have a classroom and we have a lot of side plexiglass barriers, so here, this is the Swiss parliament and they put uh, a bazillion barriers and then they wanna wear masks. This is actually a problem because they trap the air. So you have a person who's infected, this person is infected and, and instead of the ventilation taking the air away, the air is kind of trapped by this labyrinth of, of uh, plexiglass barriers. And there was this study in science where they say here, they call them desk shields, where they studied, you know, classrooms that had these lateral barriers and others that don't, the ones that did had more transmission. So it's, it's not just not doing anything. You're not just wasting money. You're actually getting more people infected. And, and this should be removed from the places where, where they're installed. Um, okay, sorry, it's more, more details than I'll jump. Now, um, sometimes people wear these face shields and they don't do anything for smoke. Imagine that you, that you go into a bar with a face shield because you don't want to smell the smoke. That wouldn't do very much. There can be transmission through the eyes, you know, like if you're in a room with a smoke and you, your eyes bother you because the smoke is getting into your eyes, right? Now, everyone I've talked to, every scientist thinks this is less dangerous than just breathing in the virus. But if you are in a high risk situation, or if you are at high risk yourself, I know you have diabetes or some other factors like that, then some goggles that, um, that basically impede the air from going uh, by your eyes can be a good idea. So these are like uh, the typical thing that you wear in chemistry labs or these are other ones from 3M. I think this cost $8, these other ones cost $16. So, so it's not, nothing that needs to be very expensive or sophisticated, but it can be useful um, in those cases. I have some, and when I go to somewhere that's high risk, I, I tend to wear them, but not always. Um, well, something else one not to do is disinfection. And again, billions of dollars and a lot of pollution for this reason, because they told us that it was going through surfaces and, and it really is probably not or, or very little, right? And, and you have people spraying disinfectants here in a theater or spraying disinfectants outdoors with drones. This is just absurd. And then, you know, here when the pandemic started, the calls to poison control centers started going up because these things are toxic. You know, you have bleach and children and alcohol and the kids put, put the Purell in their eyes. And, you know, so really disinfection, I mean, washing our hands, I said, fine, but disinfection of surfaces is not important. And it's not something we should, we should invest efforts on. Uh, so now what should we do? Okay, I told you many things that don't work. Um, once I explain how transmission worked, you're gonna find that, that it all follows pretty clearly. What did I tell you was the most effective thing to reduce transmission is doing things outdoors. So doing things outdoors is gonna be great. You know, The days and times and locations where, where it is possible is not super hot. Like for example, maybe now in Southern California will be a good time to do things outdoors during some of, some of the day, you know, probably in, in, in August may be more difficult. These are schools in New York uh, during a tuberculosis um, epidemic in 1910, and they did the school outdoors. And I don't know, I, I lived in Boston and, and they did the same in Boston also in 1910. And uh, I, they have my admiration. It's, it's really cold there in the winters and, and they still worked and the kids were doing better. This is a, an article in the New York Times in this case. Now, so that's outdoors. Outdoors works very well. If you're gonna be next to someone, wear a mask, but you know, outdoors otherwise is, is great. Now, what happens about indoors? Indoors, that's this is an indoor pandemic. Indoor is when we're getting infected and there is no silver bullet. They say, oh, I, I put my mask and I'm safe. No, 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 you need to do multiple things. And especially if there are a lot of cases um, in order to be safe. And it's kind of this Swiss cheese model that you may have seen. The idea is that, yeah, you, your mask protects you, but, but it can have a hole. It's not a perfect you know, especially in society, you know, we don't necessarily have perfect masks or they don't fit perfectly. So, you know, but, but maybe if you also keep your distance and you spend less time and you have ventilation, you know, it's the combination of factors that are gonna, that's gonna protect you. Okay. So I'll jump over this. So, um, uh, so you need to do multiple things. One thing that, um, that is very effective is to talk less loudly. 
So it's clear that when we talk, we exhale 10 times more aerosols, more virus than when we are just quietly breathing. And when we sing or we yell 50 times more. So for example, there is a lot of uh, super spreading events in choirs, you know, even in when we wrote the article in April or May of, of 2020, there were already eight or 10 super spreading events in choirs and now I, I have lost count. But to this day, I have not heard of a super spreading event in a library or in a movie theater where people are quiet. Okay, so it's very clear, nobody disputes this, that um, transmission is very strongly associated with vocalization. And in this graph, they say the more decibels, the more transmission basically, because you're putting more virus in the air. Now, uh, this can be, this can be problematic, right? In a college, you say, well, you guys can talk. There's, there's a lot of things you can do. But, but there are places like public transportation. I mean, these are signs in the metro in Mexico City um, or something like that. You can, you can do it in certain places, or you can take activities when you have to talk and take those outdoors. And then when you have to go back and talk quietly on your computer, then you, you go back and, and you do that indoors. Or, you know, to, to some extent, it can be used in some cases and it's very effective. And especially, also to identify things like wires or something like that, you have to be very careful. Um, now we have a model that works as I, as I showed you earlier, and there is nothing more practical than a good theory. So we, in, in this article, we also wrote, you know, for different types of activities, if you have um, low occupancy and, and it's indoors and well ventilated and, and you're speaking, whatever, then it's, you know, tends to be pretty safe. But, but if you have a high occupancy and it's poorly ventilated, and you are doing heavy exercise, whatever, then your chance of transmission is much higher. Okay. So, so basically all these factors that, that go into the risk parameter, you have different ways to visualize it. And this is on the internet, is one, one of the links I'll, I'll put in the chat later. And uh, you can type in your numbers. You say, well, I want to increase the ventilation, number of people you can, or change the size of the room. You can change it and see, and see what happens, okay? And it's especially useful in terms of understanding the trends, you know, or, or also, Am I in a very dangerous situation or a marginally dangerous or, or relatively safe? That kind of thing. And that's, that's that uh, spreadsheet, which I don't have time to explain. Now, masks and filters are things that work very well. A mask is a filter that we wear and our lungs, our diaphragm is the, the, the motor that, that moves the air. And you can also have a filter that, that you plug a, um, a fan on the wall and then that's what moves the air through the filter. And the idea is, is not this, is not so much that you're gonna get the aerosol stuck in the fibers, but they are microscopic physics, you know, diffusion, interception, whatever, whatever. And that's really what makes masks uh, work, okay? And, and filters. And there is a lot of people who say, oh, masks don't work because the holes in the mask are much bigger than the virus. This makes no sense. This is misinformation, okay? Now, the problem with masks is that many times, and this, I think this is the biggest problem in practice, many times people wear them and they have gaps between the mask and the face, you know, so they're wearing maybe a KN95 or something like that, but then the mask is kind of hanging from the face, so they have gaps, or with surgical masks, often these very big gaps over here. A gap that's 1% of the area of the mask, so a gap that's very small compared to the mask, half of the air that we breathe goes through here, that's what this means, you know, half the air through 1% uh, hole, you know. So the, these are data from some colleagues in, in Germany. And because the air has a much easier time going through the, through the holes than going through the, the cloth of the mask, okay? So that's a major problem. Okay? And this, there was some, some visualization, this video that you can find on YouTube where, where you can see how even on a K95 or something, because, because they didn't get these uh, pieces of metal on the nose very tight, then the air was escaping and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, so you want, the, the best masks are this type of N95, um, I guess in the US, the ones that have the stuff, the, the elastics behind the back, okay, behind the neck. Okay, those are the ones and you know, women complain that messes with, with my hair. Well, uh, it's better you, your hair than your lungs, okay? Now these ones like the KN95 or whatever, they are less good and they tend to have more leaks and there are many fakes, even though you may buy them on Amazon or whatever, many of them are fake they're still better than the surgical. Surgical is not good enough, I would say, for a virus like this. I mean, it's better than nothing, but it's not good enough. And, and, and the worst would be, of course, cloth masks. Now, if you only have surgical masks, they sell this thing, they fix the masks that you can also make yourself. And it's basically a, a contraption that closes the gaps. What they know the problem is the gaps. So for example, here, 
is closing that gap and is closing these gaps on the side. And it, it makes surgical masks work a lot better. And my colleagues have written articles on this. Now, the best and what I tend to wear for any risky situation are elast elastomeric masks. What is this? You know, so a mask, you want it to be a good filter, to be breathable and to fit. And with the N95s, they do the first two well, they fit less well. Okay, because you are asking a material that you have selected because it's a good filter and is breathable to also fit. And that's also, that's something it doesn't do as well. Yeah. Now, so this is one example of an elastomeric mask. You have a filter, which is this thing, which is an N95 filter. So it filters just as well, it's just as breathable. But then you have a support, which is plastic. And then you have the part that goes against your face, which is this, this sausage of silicone. It's, a, it's basically a ring of silicone and that pushes against your face and it seals a lot better. So even as you talk, as you move, as you get tired in the day, it's pressing against your face and, um, and it seals better and you're less likely to develop gaps. This is the one I wear, there is, there is a bunch of others. Um, there are, you know, you look a little like that Vader, but you look worse in, in the intubator. So I, I don't mind wearing it. Okay. Now we said, okay, so we can wear a mask. We can also try to remove the virus from indoor air. What could we do, you know, to do this, okay? So the virus is floating. Imagine there is a smoke in your room. How do I get rid of it? You know, there's basically three ways. If you do nothing, you know, it stays there. If you do ventilation, ventilation means that the air that has the virus goes outside, for example, through a window or through the ventilation system, and you get air from outdoors, that has less virus and that reduces the, the number of all the dots, which are the virus in the room, right? Um, so that's what ventilation means. Now, filtration is like maybe, you know, you don't have windows or, or, um, or it's noisy or polluted or whatever, and you cannot open them or, or whatever situation, then you can have a filter, just like, just like you can wear a filter, a mask, you can also have a, a HEPA filter or one of these Corsi Rosenthal boxes, and they take the air from the room and the air stays there. So the air is no longer going out, outside, but here the air is staying in the room, but the virus is staying in the filter. Okay? And this works well. And again, I have colleagues who have demonstrated it. Now, there is a third thing you can do, which is like, I'm gonna leave the air in the room and I'm gonna leave the virus floating, but I'm gonna kill the virus. I'm gonna deactivate the virus. So even though I'm gonna breathe it in, it's not gonna infect me because it has been disabled by this disinfection process. This is more problematic. And there is one type that works, which is this ultraviolet light. Um, the problem is that it's more expensive if you do it well and it's more complicated, has more risk. So in general, you know, for a prison, for the emergency room, whatever, this, this may be a good idea. For a college or whatever, or for a classroom or for a home, I say definitely not. Um, and then there is all these other techniques I think maybe, oh, okay, I thought I had a slide, but basically where people are putting ions, plasmas, photocatalysis, hydroxyls, oxidation, hypochlorous acid, foggers, ozone. I mean, basically all kinds of chemicals that are supposed to find the virus and kill it through chemical reactions. The problem is that the virus is made of nucleic acid, proteins, and lipids. And then we are in that room, we breathe the air, and we are made of nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. What hurts the virus hurts us. And it also creates other chemical contaminants. So that's all a bad idea. That said, it's being sold like hotcakes. And there are billions of dollars that schools in the US have, have wasted on this, on this stuff that, that may be doing actually harm and not protecting against the virus. Um, you know, just to, one, one thing, one question I always get is like, what about a fan, like an air conditioner, like in the window, or like one of these splitter conditioners? This is not ventilation. This is, you know, the air is coming in is being is cooling down, but is not be is not being exchanged, you know, and they, they normally don't have filters here. So this is cooling the air, making you more comfortable, but this is not ventilation, right? So this is not this is equivalent of doing nothing or close to that. Okay? Um, okay. Now we said you can get HEPA filters. This there is a huge movement of these Corsi Rosenthal boxes, which are very safe, they're very cheap. You can go to Home Depot this, this evening and make one for yourself with duct tape for $70 and per unit clean air, they are eight times cheaper than the commercial HEPA filters. Right? I mean, this is probably enough for a classroom while the other ones, you know, and it may cost you $70, the other ones will cost you $400 for a classroom, that kind of thing. Okay. I already said this, so let, let's avoid all the, all the other chemical methods. This is some data showing the, the chemicals doing damage. So the last thing I was gonna say, say CO2. Okay. 
So we humans exhale CO2. We, we, the food we eat, you know, we metabolize, we burn it basically and get the energy out and we exhale CO2 as a waste product, okay? So in outdoor air, there is about 400 parts per million. That means out of every million molecules, you know, in the air, the majority is nitrogen and oxygen, um, but 400 out of every million are CO2. And that's going up slowly as we burn fossil fuels and that causes climate change, but that's slow compared to what I'm gonna tell you. Now, uh, we are all exhaling 40,000, okay? So there is, in a room that there is nobody, there is 400, now I come in and I start exhaling 40,000, 40,000, 40,000. And over time that accumulates, you know, the CO2 also accumulates and it behaves in the air just like the virus. It accumulates, it floats around, whatever. So, so that's why we use it as an analogy. Okay? So, so ideally we would, we would measure the virus. That's not really doable for, for a reasonable cost now or, or quickly, but CO2 is easy to measure with, with one of these meters, for example, this is the, the one I happen to use, you know, there are others, they have to be infrared, they cost maybe a hundred dollars. You see I have 800 parts per, per million here. Um, this is outdoors. So this is in our house, so it's 400. This is one day we went into the car and we were recirculating the air, which I used to do to save energy since I, I was thinking about climate change, but then it got really high. So I told you I'm exhaling 40,000 and this is 4,000. 10% of the air that we were sharing in that car had already been in someone else's lungs. It was secondhand air. So that's a very dangerous situation. Now that kind of level is often seen in classrooms and in different indoor spaces. Okay? Now we just opened the windows a little and then went down a lot and it was much safer because we are inhaling much less of the air uh, from, from other people. Okay? He's telling me I'm, I'm, uh, I'm out of time. So let me just quickly. So. Uh, what we've been saying is that basically we should have in every place where we share the air, we should have publicly visible CO2 meters. Yeah? So like it, whether it's bar, a gym, a school, whatever, we should see it. This was already a law before the pandemic in Taiwan and in South Korea, which have generally done before uh, better than uh, than the US. You know, I mean, anyway, everyone has has done better than the US, but those have done uh, have done better, and this doesn't cost very much. You know. You encounter resistance because then it may, it may make obvious that ventilation is not very good. So the person in charge of ventilation may not like it, but, but it's something I think we need to push uh, for it to be everywhere. Okay. And uh, let's skip over this. And this is maybe the last one is, um, this is what happens, for example, when you take one of these CO2 meters in an airplane trip and um, you can do all kinds of experiments, you know, so for example, here, the, uh, this person was in the terminal and it was pretty clean, but then they boarded the plane. And then this is when they were in that, basically the, the boarding tunnel. And that's a place that has cooling, but doesn't have ventilation. So it got pretty high. Then they boarded in, in the plane and then it got pretty high. Then finally they took off and the ventilation really doesn't kick in at, at high level until they took off. And then during the flight, you know, so they were flying for a couple of hours and it was pretty, Descent, but then when they landed, you know, it went up again. But this person who was kind of one of the first rows got out pretty quickly, and here they got into a train and whatever, you know. So, um, you know, then and the CO2 you can measure every minute and you can see what's going on. So, certainly, when I'm, I have a big plane trip uh, coming soon, the first time I'm going to fly since, since COVID, and I'm going to certainly be doing so, some version of this. Okay, so I'm going to just leave it there and um, thank you again for your attention, and I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Jimenez. Oh my goodness, what a treat. Um, the, the science um, nerd in me, so to speak, not to speak disparagingly, I say nerd as a, as a compliment, um, is thrilled to listen to you. Yes, yeah, so we definitely had some questions. Um, Professor Plotkin, um, how do you want to, do you want to just tackle, do you want to tackle the questions that are um, in the chat first, or do we want to ask him some of our own first? Uh, let, let's do the ones that people have um, presented first. Okay. All right, so we have um, a question from uh, a Sammy in our YouTube chat. And Sammy's question, I think, was getting to the heart of essentially, so first question was, how can we compare COVID transmission with tu tuberculosis transmission? So that's the first question, Dr. Mendes. Um, well, they, they are similar. Um, tuberculosis, and, and actually we have uh, written a paper or a couple of papers comparing them, but they, they transmit in a similar way. So the, but again, once you look in the little, there are some differences. So tuberculosis is also, you know, the pathogen, which is a bacteria in this case, floats in the air. 
Now for tuberculosis, there is no debate about the droplets or anything like that, because to be infected with pulmonary tuberculosis, the bacillum, the bacterium needs to go deep into your lungs. And that only happens for these very small aerosols, right? So that's, that's well accepted. For tuberculosis, only the air matters. For COVID-19, we think the air is mostly what matters, but maybe there, are, there is a little bit through surfaces or we, we don't really know. Okay? Now, tuberculosis is less transmissible uh, than COVID. Okay? So it is a disease that infects a lot of people and kills a lot of people, but, um, and you do see super spreading events, but for example, if you look at the papers, they say, oh, there were, there were these people who were riding a school bus for four months with someone who was infected. And the thing is that people who have tuberculosis and don't know are infective for a year. So they were it's not like COVID that someone is infective for two or three days. Here they're infected for a year. So uh, over the course of sharing a school bus for months and months, they managed to infect half the people they were sharing the school, the school bus with. Okay. And there are cases like that. There's another one in a, in a military ship where you know there were the, the people who were sleeping basically in a bunk bedroom and those got infected because they had infected the person and then the air from that room was being piped to another room and those people got infected. But they were basically spending you know, eight hours a day sleeping there together for months, right? So you can get this super spreading, but, but it takes much more effort. Well, you know, for COVID, like in the case of the choir, you know, 80% got infected in two hours, right? So COVID is more transmissible. Now, COVID is not the most transmissible. Uh, missiles is even more transmissible. It's just people exhale many more viruses. It's, it's actually not very well understood exactly why, but, but it is well understood that, you know, if you are sharing the room with someone that has missiles, and not everybody is, is infective, just like COVID, but, but it can be quite dangerous. But, but to first order, we have to think of all of them in the same way and the same, the same for the flu. The flu is also less transmissible. This is maybe closer to tuberculosis, I mean, or, or between tuberculosis and COVID, right? It's, it's not, it, it has given some super spreading events that's not very common, but, but, it, but it can happen as well, right? So you have basically a spectrum with all these diseases that, they do the same thing, but some of them are more spectacular and some of them take more effort, you know, to, to transmit. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manis. Um, I think the last part of this person's question, uh, I think was comparing essentially the, in, the, the inhalation of the aerosols versus fomite or, or just touch, right? Um, and so I think their, their question was, is that the only way um, that you can be infected is, is when the droplets impact your face and that's it, or is it also the inhalation component? And I think you, you kind of touched upon this already, but can you maybe talk a little bit about, you know, the inhalation component versus touching, right? Um, you know, folks, again, worried about getting it through touch somehow. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, so for tuberculosis, it's only the inhalation. For COVID, I mean, you know, there is debate, but I'll give you my opinion. I think it's 90 or 95% inhalation and 5% everything else, you know, maybe a little touch, maybe these projectiles that, that may impact you in the eyes or something like that if someone, especially if someone coughs on your face that has COVID, that's dangerous, but that's not, that's not what's spreading the pandemic, right? Or, you know, there's also maybe, you know, it gets into your eyes in other ways, but I would say it's 90% inhalation, something like that. So you're, you're breathing okay. the virus in, that's, that's why you have to worry. Got it, okay, thank you. And we have three questions um, that are just in the chat. Um, and please folks, if you have other additional questions that, that weren't covered, or if you'd like uh, Dr. Jimenez to expound at all, please put that in the, um, the, the Q&A function. Uh, so one question, you did talk a little bit about this towards the end that I think folks are gonna be extremely interested in is airlines. So uh, Dr. Harper uh, asked, recently airlines have requested for masks not to be required. What are your thoughts on this? Will their filtration system clear the air effectively? Um... Yeah, I don't think it's a good idea as long as we have, you know, a lot of COVID around and new, more transmissible variants and all that. I don't think, I, I mean, I'm certainly, said, I'll be in an airplane on April 7th. I'm going to be wearing my best mask and I'm not going to remove it today. And, it, and also it's not just necessarily, because the airlines say, oh, we have these great filters, but, but then when people get into these airplanes, they realize the filters may only be on when the plane is in the air. But you spend a lot of time with the plane in the ground when you taxi, when you're in the terminal, or whatever, whatever, where often the ventilation system is not, or, or these filters are not engaged um, very strongly. You know, 
And then even when the filters, which are good in, in modern airplanes, now in, in regional airplanes, in older airplanes, they're not as good, but in, if you go into a modern 737 or, or a Airbus or something, they, they are good, but there is still cases where there is, there is infection. There was one of the cases I showed super spreading was an airplane that was flying into Vietnam and half of business class got infected, you know, even though, you know, it's business class and they have good filters and all that, you know, uh, it can happen and it, you know, it tends to happen, happen when people don't wear the masks. So for example, it happens when people are, are eating and they're talking, you know, when they remove the mask. So removing the masks all the time to me seems like a bad idea right now. You know, if, if the cases really go down in the summer, you know, it's a different situation, but I think there's still, I mean, seeing what we're seeing in Europe, that the cases are really, you know, there, there are countries like the UK. I think the cases in the UK now are, are as high as any time in the whole pandemic, except the peak of the Omicron wave, right? And people from the UK are flying everywhere. I mean, chances are that if you get into an airplane in California, there is someone there from the UK, you know? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so next question we have is from Samuel Sanchez. Um, you mentioned ultraviolet light to disinfect. Do you recommend having these types of disinfection methods at home or office? You touched a little bit upon that at, at the end of the question. <clears throat> No, no, I, I don't, I mean, this is something that does debate it, but the, the thing with UV light, I mean, there are different ways to accomplish getting rid of the virus, right? If you can open the windows because now it's nice and so often, open the windows, that's, it's, it's cheap and it works really well, whatever. If you can open the windows or if you're thinking about the summer when it will be too hot or whatever, get a filter or make yourself a filter one of these Corsi Rosenthal boxes. If you Google Corsi Rosenthal box, you will find lots of recipes to make them and it's not hard. I mean, they, there's fourth grade students making them by the, by the docents, you know, so certainly you, you guys can do it. And it costs $75. And, the, and they basically have a huge capacity of filtering the air, you know, so if you're gonna be, you know, if you're afraid that, that you have someone visiting or you're gonna visit your elderly mother or, or whatever situation at home or whatever, you know, just, just do that. It's, it's cheap, you know, they don't use much electricity, it's just a box fan, you know. Now, let's say you wanna do UV disinfection. Well, it's gonna cost you more money. You're not talking to about hundreds to thousands. Then this ultraviolet light may lead to some chemistry. So you may be exposed to some, some chemicals maybe. I mean, we're studying that. And also if, uh, you know, if it's not well designed or a kid breaks it or something like that, and suddenly you're exposed to the ultraviolet lights, that's very damaging for your eyes and your skin. You know, this, this UV light is not the UV light of the tanning salon. This is a, a stronger UV light that is, that is only in the, in the stratosphere and really burns your skin and whatever. And, you know, so why do that and, and play with, with fire and it's more expensive when you can do one of these filters that, that doesn't have any risk. And in addition, if you have a filter, it not only removes the virus, it also removes allergens and pollution, you know, and where you guys are, Southern California, there is a lot of particulate pollution, you know, if there is a day with low visibilities and, and the filter also cleans that up. I mean, this, this type of filter was really developed first for forest fires. You know, you have a forest fire and it's getting into your home, then you remove the smoke with this, you know? So uh, yeah, so I would say that's, that's just much better than, than disinfection. Okay, well, we're definitely getting questions related relative to air purifiers, HEPA filters. Um, and so we have a couple questions related to this. Um, maybe perhaps you can expound a little bit. So Alyssa Garcia, do you recommend to have an air purifier in the house? And then another related question, another from Julie, uh, for a home with a thousand square feet, no doors on rooms, but not really open plan, how many uh, Corey Rosenthal boxes for the space? Two, one at each end. And then apparently this is a level house, so it meant multi-level, so for each level, um, just wanting to filter the main level. Um, hmm. I would say it, it depends. I mean, this is where um, um, one at least, maybe one is enough, maybe not. It depends what the air is doing. And, and then, so what is the air doing in your house? I don't know the house, right? But, but you can do, I mean, the thing about the air is kind of like smoke. So you can light a cigarette or lit some matches and then you see what the smoke does and do that in every room and see what the smoke is doing. Is there, if you have some smoke in one room, is it gonna be filtered by the box, which is in the other part of the house or, or how should we, you know, how should you deal with that? I mean, we have, um, our house is more or less that size. 
So we have two HEPA filters because we, we bought them early when I didn't know about these Corsi boxes. And they, we tend to have them in, in basically to the living room and one of the bedrooms where we spend most time, you know. They are not always on, but you know, if uh, we, you know, we, we, tr we try to keep them on, you know, our son is, has been going to school and when there are more cases and whatever to keep them on if, if we remember. Or, and sometimes there is, um, my mother-in-law may come and she's at higher risk. So then we definitely keep them on and, you know, that kind of thing. All right. Um, so this is another relative to specifically um, being indoors and, in, and specifically uh, in school. So uh, Anonymous asks, in schools, does using a bigger room with smaller populations of students help with the rate of exhal uh, exhalation and inhalation that is shared? It seems that if the way, if it seems as if the way we do school is problematic in light of how COVID is transmitted. So bigger room, smaller populations. Um, yeah, that, that, that is helpful. Um, so um, the, I mean, so we're saying the, the, like the smoke, the air that we exhale gets diluted in the volume. So if you are, imagine you are in one of these big churches or something and, and someone is smoking, you know, the air has a lot of, a lot of, space to, to diffuse and get diluted. If you're in a very small room, you know, it's, it's gonna be much more concentrated. So the, the bigger the room, the fewer the people, the shorter the time, the less loud you talk, all of those things make, make the thing safer. Now, um, classrooms, you know, it, it depends. I mean, it, they come, they're not the most dangerous place because, you know, um, they tend to have some ventilation and most people are not talking, right? Normally the teacher is talking and, and we tend to be wearing masks. I don't know if, if in your college you do, but um, uh, so far I think in many places where I still wear masks, so you know, so you can make them relatively safe. Like here at our university, we talked to the facilities people and they increased the ventilation. And then there were some really old buildings that didn't have ventilation, so it couldn't be increased. So then they, they installed some filters. Right, in, in those ones that, that you see that couldn't be done in another way. Now, if you say you have some, some classes in which uh, you, you really have to work in groups and talk to each other, I would say, do all it outdoors if you can, or, or make sure you wear masks when, um, when you're talking, you know? And also, the, if, the, if it's mostly the teacher talking, then the teacher should be wearing a mask. You know, you, you often see this, and it's the opposite of what should be done, that people are gonna talk and they remove the mask to talk. No, 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 you should put on the mask to talk because that's when you need it. You know, so it's, uh, and you know, normally you can understand people just, just fine. Um, well, so yeah, I mean, it's the, what is the most dangerous situation? What, what is a situation where a lot of people are spending a lot of time in a small space talking loudly without masks? A bar? <laughs> Right. Without masks, right? Without masks, maybe a bar, a restaurant, uh, a choir, you know. And, um, uh, gyms are also, because when, when we're in a gym, we expel also more virus when we exercise. And we're also breathing in more air because of the exercise. So gyms are also, so those are the, the most dangerous places. I would say school is something in the middle and, and can be made safer through these, through these measures. Now, if we start doing nothing, you know, if we go back to, okay, we're going to do, School just like we were without any mask, without any extra ventilation, without any, you know, then we are going to have transmission. Okay, we have one question, a couple more questions, and then obviously uh, I know Professor Plotkin has a few that we would like you to expand just a bit on. Um, so we have Andrew in the YouTube chat. I know that risk assessment can get very nuanced, but what would you say to people who believe that they're not a significant risk because they're vaccinated or have already had COVID? Um, that I, I wish they were right, but they're not, um, because they, you know, there are, there are diseases like uh, measles is an example, like the measles virus, if it mutates and it changes, it no longer works. It no long, it's no longer able to infect, you know? So you get vaccinated once and then you are vaccinated forever, or you have the disease once and you basically are never going to get it again, right? Um, However, the COVID virus or the flu virus are not like that. For the flu, we were getting the flu shot every year, right? And for COVID, you know, we, we see what happens that the virus changes and, and we get new variants. And how do we get new variants? We get the new variants that jump over the vaccines and over prior infection the best, right? So, and, and so you can still get it and you can still die and you can still have a long COVID or a serious case 
despite being vaccinated or having had COVID. And you can give it to other people. Like sometimes, you know, people say, oh, I'm, I'm young, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have too much of a problem, but you can give it to someone in your family or some friend or someone that has comorbidities or someone who's totally healthy, but they, uh, for whatever reason, they still die or have, uh, you know, long, long-term long problems. So, so I would say, you know, we have to, I mean, I mean, we have to think about the weakest among us, right? I mean, there's a, in a large community like a college, you, you have people who are gonna have diabetes, obesity, hypertension, different uh, health, uh, things that put them at risk and and um, or immuno, immunosuppressed people or people you know people have cancer or different things and and you want to protect everybody there is um, anyway so you, you you pretty much answered this question but just uh, I think so we're clear um, so Sheila asks um, in regards to patients with comorbidities such as diabetes uh, and other risk factors I'm adding that for, to Sheila's question uh, do you think going going out without a mask is safe for them, even though they are vaccinated. And I think you kind of answered that already. For the people who have comorbidities, I think it's definitely, I mean, right now, I mean, with, with so many cases that are there and, and even if they're vaccinated, of course I will go. I mean, as I said, I, we have someone in the family who has a lot of comorbidities. I mean, um, among her case that she can only go places if, if she wear the mask because, because it would be very risky otherwise. It's, is less risky than if she wasn't vaccinated, but it's still pretty risky, you know? Okay, so wearing, continuing to wear a mask even though you're vaccinated is still um, a good idea not, in your opinion. Not only continue to wear a mask, but up your mask gain. You know, so a lot of people say, I wear a mask and, they, and then you see that they're wearing this terrible cloth mask with gaps everywhere. And then they say, well, I have trouble breathing. And then you try that type of mask and yeah, it's hard to breathe because the mask is very bad and it's, it's like trying to breathe through a piece of jeans that you have cut. You know, get a good N95 and they're actually much easier to breathe with and they're gonna protect you a lot better. You know, and it, it's clear that COVID is gonna be with us. I mean, we don't know exactly what shape is gonna take, but it's gonna be around for a while. And now we know the flu is also airborne and who knows when the next pandemic, you know, we all have to learn about these good masks. You may as well learn now. And then you have it and then it thinks, you know, the summer is good, it's better than you. Maybe we can we can ditch the mask for a while, but but you know why not invest and, and learn and, and do it better, you know. And so we have someone who's a teacher of preschool. Um, anonymous asks, and I think this is going to be relevant for a lot of our parents on the line. I teach preschool. The kids mask, but not efficiently. They're in class for two point five hours, not socially distancing or modulating the voices. Obviously, they aren't vaccinated. We keep the windows open with circulating fans and run air purifiers. We spend as much time outdoors as possible. Do you have any other suggestions for us? Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you're already doing what, what, what I could tell you is um, um, make sure your air purifier is just a filter or, or put some of this. I mean, sometimes with the air purifiers, like I've gone to some medical uh, offices here in Boulder and they say, oh, look, we have this air purifier. And they have this air purifier, which is so small that looks like a toy. And then when you get close, it's actually off because it makes noise. <laughs> so, you know, so an air purifier, get one of these Corsi Rosenthal boxes that uh, said you can make one for $70. That's a real air purifier. That's really going to do a lot of benefits. So, if you have something smaller or you are not sure what technology is there, it has some ions or something, maybe it doesn't work. Um, then I would say, you know, the, the teachers should be wearing good masks themselves, like N95, mm -hmm. something like that. Now, for the kids, I mean, at those ages, it's difficult. That said, I mean, I have, um, now he's eight, he was five when the pandemic started, so a, a kid, and it, it has never been his favorite activity, but, you know, he, he tolerates the mask, and we've tried different masks, and, and for, for very small kids, like the Korean KF94s tend to fit better. Um, you know, do what you can. It's obvious you, you, it, it can be difficult, but but yeah, I mean, you, you can reduce that. Just those things can make a huge dent. And we also know, I mean, something else, uh, some of the people say, well, you, you cannot avoid getting it. Some people say that, which I don't think is true, but but it, it seems clear that there is, the higher the dose, the worse, uh, the worse the disease. So if you breathe in a small amount of virus, you're gonna have more likely to have a mild case. If you breathe in a ton of virus, you are more, more likely to develop a more serious case, right? So, so you wanna, you know, so if you do everything you can, maybe you don't eliminate all the transmission, but whatever transmission happens, 
gives rise to milder cases, right? Okay, I know we have some um, last questions. I know Professor Plotkin um, wants to ask. Um, so I'll just give just one last question because I don't think I got to this one. And I think this is relative to uh, the variant that the B, perhaps the B2 uh, Omicron variant, but I'm not sure. I'm just gonna quote Saul. What about the new C19 variant in Europe? I think he's, I think they're referring to um, perhaps the, the the new B2, if I'm saying it right, right? The, the BA2. The, the BA2, right? BA2, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, um, <laughs> It's, it's more contagious, so it's, it's quite a bit more contagious even than the first Omicron. And people who have had Omicron only have partial immunity against it, that's why it's spreading again. Now, I haven't seen studies yet whether it's more serious or, or just the same as Omicron. I, uh, I would assume, I, it could be that there have been studies very recently and I just haven't seen them. I would assume that is that is the same, that it is dangerous. I mean, this is still some version of, of, of the same virus. And it has, I mean, one problem with this virus is it can infect the lungs and give you this acute disease, but it can also then do damage to the brain and, and infects um, the kidneys and you know the different different organs and and, um, and the pancreas and can give rise to many different problems. And also your your blood, uh, your blood vessels and then. I mean, one of the theories is that long COVID is due to basically the, the blood vessels get infected and then inflamed, and then you get less blood flow into the organs. So then whichever organ you already didn't have in great shape it starts to fail, you know, like for some, and for some people it's the kidney, for other people it's, you know, uh, the pancreas or whatever. Yeah, so you, you mentioned that the, um masks work not by uh, stopping the, the particles particularly, but by slowing the inertia of the aerosols. Is that essentially what you were saying about the ma how masks work? No, not quite, not quite. Um, what I was saying is they're not a colander. Many times you will see, you go to Twitter and say, masks don't work because you know the, the holes in the mask are this big and the aerosol is very small. So therefore, people have this image that to stop it, you need a colander or a sieve and, and the hole to be smaller than the aerosol and only then mask will work. But really what happens microscopically is that is you, you guys know about Brownian motion. The, these very small aerosols are not moving like a, like a projectile, they are, they are kind of moving like this in the air. And also there is electrostatic attraction, like there is different physics that we are not used to, but that play a role in these microscopic interactions and, and that so you can have something like an N95, which can remove 95 or 99% of, um, of the aerosols, even though the holes are bigger than, than the aerosols that we're trying to filter. The, the New York Times, if you, if you Google it on the New York Times, they have a, a really cool computer animation where you kind of, kind of follow in the aerosol and they have the fibers and, and they, it's a very good visualization of, of mask. So d does that have any practical implications in terms of how often we should change our masks? Um, I, not that explanation, but but we know in terms of how often we should change them. Um, I would say for most people, um, if you have an N95, they certainly work for 40 hours, right? So certainly you can wear it to work. If you have to work in person, you can wear it for a week and you don't have to change it more often than that. There used to be, you know, in hospitals, sometimes they told them you put an N95 on to see uh, uh, an infected person and then you throw it out immediately or, or things like that. It doesn't make sense. Certainly not in society, in a college or anywhere like that. You, know, you can wear them for, uh, for good amounts of time. The, the masks that I have, you know, I, I mean, I may go indoors a few hours a day or maybe a, uh, eight hours, depending what I'm doing, uh, when I'm working, whatever. And, you know, I may, I may change the filter or I may change the mask every week or every couple of weeks. Once I have accumulated more or less 40 hours or something like that. If you work in, in a more dangerous place like a hospital, so sometimes what people do is they have masks for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, and then they have the mask they wear on Monday and then they hang it just basically so any virus that's there is going to decay and then they wear the mask for Tuesday. And then by the next Monday, any virus that was on the Monday mask is, is no longer infective and, you know, Mm -hmm. If I work in a hospital, I'll probably do that. But uh, but for a college, it seems overkill to me. Mm. So um, you, you mentioned electrostatic interactions with aerosols. And it is, are 
Is it possible that we could manipulate aerosols with using their electros, electrical charges to reduce the load of aerosols in an indoor space? Yeah, that, that, that is what N95s are. And, um, and basically HEPA filters, they, they, I mean, the invention of the N95, and there, there is a video by, in YouTube by Minute Physics, I think it's called, the, it's the amazing physics of the N95 or something like that. It's really well done. And he explains how um, is the, the trick of the N95s is they have these fibers that are very thin and very, it's like a forest of fibers. Um, but then they put some electrostatic charge. And then when, when your aerosol goes by, that electrostatic charge is, is like a hook. It's kind of attracting the aerosol mm -hmm. and making it stick more. So, so we are already using it for that purpose. Now, um, if you said, I'm going to put an electric field across a room or something like that, it, that doesn't work so well. I mean, there are devices called elect electrostatic precipitators, which are basically some some version of that, but those, I, I wouldn't say that they are such a good idea. That That is more, just, just the regular filters like the Corsi boxes are, are um, cheap and they work well. And, and you know, um, I, so I would go with those. Mm -hmm. So there aren't any effective technologies for affecting the entire indoor space Really, the air has to be drawn through a filter to be able to take advantage of the charges. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or either a filter or some other device. I mean, there is one technology that um, that you can get, which is this UV light. In, in most cases, the UV light is a box because the the UV light it has people shouldn't be exposed to it. But there is one new technology with UV light at two hundred and twenty two nanometers, which is a new type of light. And apparently you can shine that on people and you can shine that on the room and that will kill a virus anywhere in the room. It has only one problem, which is super expensive. So, so there's very few places where, um, where it's being installed. Maybe, you know, maybe in five years, you know, the, the, that's, we will have that, that everywhere, but it's not really, I mean, you can buy it if your name is Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or whatever, but uh, Jose Jimenez doesn't have that in his classroom. <laughs> uh, Dr. Oh. Jimenez. Uh, Dr. Jimenez, I, I have one question, and, and I know Dr. Pog, I don't know if you want, or first of all, if you wanted to get to any others, um, but I did have one question. What would you say is your, and I know it's hard to predict, right? We were chatting about this before the webinar, but what would you say would be your and or prediction in terms of um, where you see us going in terms of the response to the pandemic as it goes on? And, and, and what I mean by that is in terms of masking, in terms of all the things that you laid out, um, based on what you know your experience has been and based on you know what you and your colleagues are seeing uh, uh, I mean there is there is really two questions there one is what is the disease going to be what other variants are going to have whatever whatever and nobody really knows I mean I think I think everyone's impression is not going to disappear right we're going to have some level of cases of COVID for the next year maybe two maybe ten right uh, is it going to be a low level, so it kind of recedes in our in our worries, or is it going to be, are we going to have more waves? Nobody really knows. I, I suspect we'll have some waves, maybe not as bad as some of the ones we've had, and hopefully we may have some better vaccines maybe by the end of the year, um, so we may get vaccinated again. And you know, but uh, in terms of what we humans are going to do and what the governments are going to do. Uh, <laughs> uh, this pandemic has has not reinforced my faith in governments. I mean, I think that um, politically, I mean, after the first wave, when we were all scared and people were, were willing to do whatever was needed, really, you know, uh, politics has really invaded, uh, it's, it's become a political issue in, in many countries, certainly in the US, and, and that really gets in the way. So, you know, I mean, I, I think it will be just like now, I mean, you go to some colleges, some schools, some places, and they still have a mass mandate, others don't, some are ventilating, others are not, and, and it's a mess, you know, and then in some places they have, you know, more cases, others are they're protected, and um, unfortunately, I fear we'll be in some version of that, you know, but, but it's still, um, the tone that the CDC sets is, is very important, so I'm, I mentioned in, in the talk that the, the White House is now accepting that we that the main way we get infected is by breathing the virus in. This is this is new. This is not something 
they've said before, even though President Trump <laughs> said in, in, in February 2020, that's how you get it in, you're breathing it in. But, but really now the White House saying it, now that this is really what we believe. Is, is this gonna change things or uh, I don't know. There have been previous times that there have been public announcements and my colleagues and I were very excited and then not much happens. You know, people who are paying attention um, do something or whatever, but then a lot of society, you know, is, is too busy to pay attention. And so, I did, yeah, I did, so, sorry, I, I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> So I don't really know, but but that, those are some thoughts for what's worth. Professor Plotkin? Um, so, um, so I guess I don't know if you can answer this, but you you mentioned that that you had a lot of trouble with with who um, being sort of entrenched in old school thinking about about um, transmission. And uh, ha has there been any progress in 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 um, medical groups changing their their view on how viruses are transmitted um, due to your and others' research? There, there has been a lot of progress, but nowhere near as much progress as, as we need. And the problem is that I would say the medical profession in general. I think most of them understand this going through the air. The problem is that. The people who have power at WHO or CDC, whatever, is not the medical profession in general. It's basically the epidemiologists, the public health professionals, and the infection preven prevention doctors, which is a spe very specific specialty for doctors. And that those people are the ones that are really stuck in the old thinking, you know. So unfortunately, we have convinced the people who matter less and the people who really have the power to to change and, and to change what CDC says and whatever, they are the ones that, because they were the most confused for these historical reasons, they are the ones that are being the most recalcitrant. You know, I mean, they keep they keep moving. I mean, the evidence is so clear that they keep moving in this direction, but it's just a, at the pace of a snail. And, you know, so we, we were just commenting with our colleagues, like now that the White House is saying this, so for example, the Infectious Disease Society of America and the Association of Infection, Infection Control Professionals. So these are basically the, the associations of these doctors that, that, that I'm telling you about that are the ones that have the power. Those have, have not said anything like the White House and, and their, their statements are still very confused. And they say, well, it's possible it goes to the air, but we don't really know. You know, is is the is the White House saying this going to change them, and then next week they're going to say the same thing, or are they going to continue to resist? This, I I cannot predict. My my impression is that it will still take a while. Understood. Um, one yeah. question. One question I have uh, is, can you uh, talk about or, or what are some I guess reputable ways, or what would you recommend in terms of? And I know you probably can't endorse. But uh, in terms of HEPA filters, and I know we're reaching towards the end of our time, so I'm conscious of that. Um, HEPA filters and or brands um, or uh, masks where folks can get some reputable areas. Uh -huh. So, um, and I don't have any, I don't get paid by anybody of any of these companies, whatever. I can, I can mention the ones I, I use, you know, uh, which I pay for, you know. So for example, for the, for the HEPA filters, um, I have a colleague here who has investigated some and they were, um, I mean, what I would say, what, what she told me is that um, go with a brand that's reasonably well known. So maybe, you know, there's the Huawei, I think some of the well-known Chinese brands or Honeywell or, or Conway is another good brand, you know, and, and go for the ones that only have a filter. Don't some of them have UV or ions or whatever that doesn't do anything and it's costing you extra money. So go for one that only has a filter. If you are gonna buy a HEPA filter, I would say, you know, I bought HEPA filters because I didn't know if I was gonna do it now, I would build one of these Corsi boxes. I will go to Home Depot or Lowe's and, and do that definitely. You know, it's like, I mean, they're safe. They've been tested by our colleagues. They, you know, they've been tested by the EPA, whatever. Um, now for, uh, and but really what matters with any of these things is the question we were talking about earlier. How big is it compared to your room and do you have it at the highest power, you know? So, and, and then the question that, that often comes in is noise. What if it's very noisy, right? And um, so you also have to look at how many decibels, you know, the, you wanna buy one that's, that's less noisy. 
Uh, and I can put a link on the chat. There is someone who has basically cataloged these things, the price, the noise, whatever, whatever, um, and for all the ones that are available in the US. So, so if I was gonna buy another one, I would go there. Um, with, respect, with respect to masks, I would say you wanna get some good N95. I would avoid the KN95s for two reasons. One is even if they are real KN95s, they, they seal as well. So they're very popular because you can ship them flat. So they're very cheap. You can ship them from China and they're cheaper than the other masks. But being flat makes that, that you often have gaps between your face and the side of the, K, of the KN95. The other thing is that half of the ones that are being sold are fake, but you or I cannot tell whether they are fake. They look normal, you know, but then you are not really protected. So I avoid the KN95s. There is another type which is called the KF94. Those are from Korea and those don't have fakes. And those work well. So if you really want someone that goes on your ears, I would go with a KF94. And there are, I mean, there are different brands. Um, if, but I, what I would recommend the most is an N95, which is, I mean, the ones I use happen to be the ones from 3M, like the 3M Aura is, is a good one. And there is also another one that's called the 3M V-Flex. And really depends on your face. We all have different faces, right? And uh, what fits me well may not fit you and that kind of thing. And I mean, as I said, I tend to use this elastomeric one, which the one I happen to use is called Envo mask. But again, if you Google elastomeric masks, there are people who, there is this person in, in Twitter and YouTube called Mask Nerd. And he's someone actually I, I've, I've gotten to know and he's, he's done a million reviews of, of masks and I, I would trust what, what this person says. For my kid who's seven, I use one who's eight now. What is that called? It's called Flo, F-L-O mask. And he's, he's also a, a small elastomeric mask and he tolerates it well. So, you know, I mean, they, those are just some, some of the options that, that I happen to use. And as I said, I pay for, I don't get any, any money from those, but, but since you asked, that's what I, that's what I would recommend. But, but at the end, you know, you also have to see the, the best mask is the one that fits you well and that you will wear, you know. Thank you for saying that because I think you're right, right? The best mask is one you will wear and that fits you correctly. Obviously, there, there are better and there are best. Yeah. Um, Professor Plotkin, I know we're at the end of our time, um, Dr. Jimenez, yeah. uh, or how much are you able to go a few more minutes or, or do we need to get going? I want to respect your time. I, I can go a few more minutes. If, okay. If um, Professor Plotkin, did you have any um, kind of last questions we wanted Dr. Jimenez to touch upon? Um, I think, to see, does anyone, anyone who's still with us have any additional questions? I mean, obviously we could go on all night, but um, <laughs> we all have other things to do. This is Absolutely. really hey, we do have fascinating one question. information. But one question from Sheila, uh, doctor, what is the right response to people that believes vaccine is, is a government co-working in pharma with pharmacy industry scheme? In other words, folks that are doubting vaccines. Oh um, boy, <laughs> that's a longer conversation. That is a long conversation. <laughs> I mean, it's a... Uh... Uh, the, I mean, it's, it's, it's not that, but I mean, it's, you're not going to have a lot of success just telling them that. I mean, I've, I've had those debates on, on Twitter and and uh, or with people I know, and it, it can be very difficult to convince. I mean, and the, the problem is the pharmaceutical industry is very problematic, and they, there is there is many things they do that are not good, and you know, you know, so it's not like the problem is then this skeptics people you know they say oh look the pharmaceutical industry does this and it doesn't do well therefore they're also cheating on these other things and i mean at the end the the, um, the science and the test of the vaccines were done very well they didn't want to cut corners because they they cut some corners i think it was in 1960s and then there were a lot of cases of kids that uh, developed serious health problems and whatever so so you know basically even though there was this emergency they didn't um they didn't cut any corners. Now, if you explain this to people, they are not going to believe you. You know, that's the. I mean, but anyway, you 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 can try keep keep calm and, I mean, if, if they are your family or they are, they are they're worth, uh, if, if they're willing to have a debate, you know, uh, I mean, and, and there are, there are a lot of resources online that, that that you can search about about these things. But um, yeah, it's it's that's what I was referring with the politics. I mean, it's the same with masks and. And it's the same with a lot of the things that work, you know, um, that unfortunately they, they become a hot potato, a political hot potato or, a, you know. Right. 
Well, thank you for trying. Uh, last question. I think this will probably be our official last question for the program. Yeah. Um, and we have Professor uh, Harper, who actually works with our in our child development, um, works our child development department. Uh, so for teachers, I think in general, what would you recommend? And I, you touched upon us a, a bit, but if you're a teacher coming back to teach in the classroom and you have folks that may or may not be wearing masks, what would be uh, your best recommendation? Um, there's some folks that have air filters, small air filters potentially on their desk um, with HEPA, would that help? Um, what would be your recommendation for those folks? Um, so I, I'm, I'm lucky and I'm on sabbatical this semester, but if I was teaching, um, I would be, I would be wearing a good mask, you know, probably this elastomeric because if I'm talking that I know it could fit into my face and I may have a filter next, next to me or a couple of filters in the class and I will have to see kind of the, I, will, I would test kind of the noise, you know, it's like, okay, is, is, is this filter too noisy? What, what can I do? Where can I put it? If you can only have a small filter, then yeah, you, you can have it with the cleaner going towards your face, you know? So those are things you can do. If you can open the windows, or if you can do some some periods, some class periods outdoors, especially when the students have to talk. Now you can encourage the students to to wear masks and to wear good masks. Like um, I mean, last semester I was teaching, so I I just bought out of my pocket uh, a bunch of uh, N95s, and I just would give them for free. And they said you don't have to, but but would you mind wearing this free N95 I'm giving you? And most did, not everybody did, and you know what can you do? You can force them, but but at least I think, and I think most people were, were grateful, you know. So you, you can you can make things a little safer that way. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Jimenez, um, Professor yes. Blacken. Any last words? Well, thank you so much for coming on Zoom, and um, yeah, we had a really great turnout. I think some, seems like a lot of people were inspired to um, rethink their their protocols for remaining safe. And uh, yeah, we, we appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, so I'll, I'll echo Professor Plotkin. Thank you, Dr. Jimenez. I'm absolutely honored that you um, took the time out of your very busy schedule. Trust me, this, this recording will get spread large up and down the state of California. Um, you're doing fabulous work. And if I can just personally say you've given a lot of us hope and inspiration um, and certainly our students who see you and you reflect them. So uh, we hope to just follow your career and best of luck to you, sir. I hope safe travels um, and big shout out to all the staff that helped support Suzanne, Deja, Maricela. Thanks to all the faculty, Professor Plotkin for supporting this event. And certainly thanks to um, all of us at MSGC just trying to get through this pandemic and, and protect ourselves. So thank you all. Thanks for joining us. We'll have the recording up shortly. Um, and yeah, take care of yourselves. Th thank you for inviting me and for listening. And, and thank you, Maya, for for insisting when I was very distracted. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, sir. And please keep posting on Twitter. We're following you. Please follow Dr. Jimenez on Twitter. All right. Take thank care. You.